Hi everyone, my name is Melissa Zarnowski. I work for the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. And today I'm gonna to be presenting on a project that we've been working on for the past five years, which is monitoring stream connectivity with trail cameras. I realize this is a forest ecosystem conference, so I'm not entirely sure how much of this will apply to your work, but hopefully you will leave this presentation with some good ideas for your own projects. Before I get started, I just want to say that we recently published this article, A Novel Method to Evaluate Stream Connectivity Using Trail Cameras in River Research and Applications, which goes into depth about our methods for evaluating stream connectivity through pictures, if you want to dig into our research after this presentation. And I just want to acknowledge the main author, Chris Bellucci, and co-authors Mary Becker and Corinne Fitting. And in addition, Ali Hibbert and Laura Robbins, who have been instrumental in helping me with the field work. So I've provided the link to that article right here in this corner in case you're interested. Today, I'm going to go over a brief background of why we decided to start using trail cameras to monitor stream connectivity, our method, how we evaluate stream flow from the pictures, the metrics we use to evaluate stream flow impairment, and a few examples of what we've seen so far. So why monitor stream flow with pictures? Well, first and foremost, pictures speak a thousand words. All of these pictures were taken on August 21st, 2020. Two of these streams are completely dry, as you can see on the left, and two of these streams have flowing water on the right. The two streams that are completely dry are located within the vicinity of water withdrawals, which leads me to my second point. We began this project to document the effects of water withdrawals on stream flow. One of DEEP's responsibilities is to regulate water usage over 50,000 gallons per day through a permitting program that was established in 1982. Any water diversion that existed prior to 1982 was allowed to continue withdrawing as much water as they registered for without any kind of environmental assessment or public review. These are known as registered diversions. Today, we are observing some of these streams dry up next to these registered diversions like these two shown here. So we knew that they were a problem, but we didn't really have a good handle on the scope of the problem. Like when does it go dry and for how long? And since stream gauges are few and far between, we needed to figure out a better way to document stream flow differently. Our solution was to use trail cameras. One thing that I wanna emphasize is that photos are data that provide a record of conditions. The photos need to be clear, centered, and without any obstructions. Without this, we wouldn't be able to qualitatively and semi-quantitatively assess stream flow. Stream connectivity is important for the ecological health of the stream and downstream waters. We define stream connectivity as hydrologically connected pools and riffles that link stream habitat along a longitudinal continuum, so that's upstream to downstream, while also recognizing the lateral dimension, the connection to the floodplain, and vertical connection to groundwater. We focus on the rearing and growth bio period, which is from July 1st through October 31st. These are the flows that are needed to sustain aquatic life, and also typically the season of highest conflict with human uses, such as lawn irrigation. This diagram shows our method for how we go from pictures to metrics to help inform decision makers. I'll go into detail on a few of these in the next couple of slides, but in general, we select a location on a stream that captures at least one riffle pool sequence. When we deploy the trail camera, we set it to take one picture per hour. When we download the images back in the office, we assign a stream connectivity category to each image, which I will go into more detail in the next slide. And then based on those categories, we calculate the average daily stream connectivity metrics which I will also go into more detail on. So this helps us to visualize the data and it helps us to inform stream management. We developed a six category system to describe the variations in stream connectivity observed using trail camera images. Category one is completely dry. Category two has some pools of standing water, but no flow. Category three has a minimal flow in which some pools and riffles are disconnected and some habitat types are not accessible. Category four has flows with well-connected pools and riffles. 
Category 5 is where the flow fills the stream channel at or just below bankful discharge. And Category 6 is when the flows are above the bankful discharge and into the floodplain. Once we download the pictures from the field, we assign each picture one of these categories. We then use the categorical data to calculate metrics that quantify stream connectivity. We developed 30 stream connectivity metrics to represent this data. The duration metrics represent a period of time and images associated with a category. For example, the average number of consecutive days in category one. The frequency metrics represent how often an image is in a category, such as number of days in category one. The magnitude metrics provide a statistical summary of a category, such as the average flow category. And the timing metrics describe when a category occurs temporally, such as the Julian day of the first observation in category one. So here's an example of the timing and duration metrics. Here we have seven streams that we monitored with trail cameras. The bars represent the stream flow from July through October. The blue sections of the bars show when the stream was connected. The pink sections show when the stream was disconnected and the red sections show when the stream was completely dry. As you can see from this figure, four of the streams that we monitored stayed connected throughout the study period. Two of these streams jumped back and forth between connected, disconnected, and dry and one of these streams clearly had a gradual decrease in stream flow until it remained dry throughout the study period. Here's an example of one of the frequency metrics, the number of days from July through October in which the flow was dry. Here you can see that Chitsey Brook had the most number of days, almost 50, in which it was dry, followed by Mill River and Cobble Brook. The four other streams had no days in which the flow was dry as this was also represented on the previous figure. And here's an example of the magnitude metrics, the average flow from July through October. This figure shows that four of these streams had an average flow category of four, whereas the other streams had an average flow category between two and three. This metrics example is a little more complicated, but I think it's worth explaining. Here we have the seven streams that we've been looking at in the previous examples. Each line represents the change in stream flow from July 1st through October 31st. The white areas of the bars represent connected flow, and the gray areas of the bars represent disconnected flow. Now, the blue sections of the lines show when the USGS reference gauges had normal to high flows. The black sections of the lines show when the USGS reference gauges had low flows. So we would expect the blue sections of the lines to be in the white areas of the bars and the black sections of the lines to be in the gray areas of the bars. We mostly want to focus on the blue sections of the lines being in the gray areas of the bars since we are specifically looking for flow impaired streams. I just want to point out a few examples of where this occurred. As you can see, these three streams were observed to have disconnected stream flow when the USGS reference gauges had normal to high flows, adding data to the conclusion that these three streams are flow impaired. These are the same three streams that we've been seeing as flow impaired in the previous examples. Now, I just want to take you through an example of one of our trail cameras located near a USGS stream gauge. This is a short period from September 7th through October 2nd of 2016. And if you pay attention to this little red star on the hydrograph, you'll see how it correlates with the stream flow in the picture. So here we have September 7th with a stream flow of 2.7 cubic feet per second. September 10th, 2.20 cubic feet per second. And now it's dropping to 1.2 CFS, and you can see that clearly in the stream flow in the picture. It jumps up to 3.2 CFS, goes back down to 0.97 CFS, jumps up to 4 CFS after a rain event, goes back down to 1.4 CFS, 
and ends with 2.4 cubic feet per second. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, before we began this project, we didn't have a good handle on the scope of the issue of flow impaired streams. The department is required to identify flow impairments for the Integrated Water Quality Report, which is a report that goes to the EPA every two years. In 2014, we had identified 34 miles of flow impaired streams throughout the state. And in 2016, after we began this project, we identified 159 miles of flow impaired streams. And finally, as an added bonus to this trail camera project, we get lots of wildlife images, which is always fun to look at. All of the source code and data for this project are freely available and open source at this link right here, github.com slash Mary Becker slash stream connectivity metrics. And with that, I would just like to say thank you for taking the time to listen to my presentation today, and I will take any questions.